All right, so this is a talk uh, in which I am bringing intentionally very little prepared content. It's much more of a discussion than, uh, than a speaking at you sort of talk. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about fluency, um, agile fluency and fluency models, um, and then in particular uh, apply that to engineering. Um, and then we're going to go through this particular model that I have, this big graph, um, which is I'll zoom in as we start to look at various pieces of it. But it's this massive dependency chart that's sort of based off of my experience with a number of different teams. The various practices and techniques that people use in engineering um, across the couple of three years as they go, two to three years, as they go from basically scrummish, working as teams uh, or, or individuals, but often component teams and that sort of thing, um, to uh, getting ready and doing continuous delivery and lean startup and data-driven decision-making and prepared to go into the organizational changes, uh, or the, the, the real change in power and dynamics that happen in a company. So this is basically everything that leads to being able to ship at will um, and not have any bugs. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do in this talk is I'll talk a little bit about fluency and some of the overall model, and then we're just going to go in and explore a lot of parts of this graph. And we're going to explore whatever parts you guys find interesting. So although nominally this is a talk followed by questions at the end, um, if you wait to the end to give the questions, then it will be a 10-minute talk, a silent bit, and then a five-minute hurry. So, <laughs> so hopefully the questions will come a little earlier. Uh, so um, let's first talk about fluency. Um, and, uh, and this is actually one of the more important aspects here. Uh, this is a fluency model. This isn't a proficiency model. And what I mean by that is a lot of ways that we talk about uh, becoming more effective at software development are maturity or proficiency models. Do you do X? You know, are you a team that regularly inspects and adapts uh, or not? Right? And those sorts of things. Um, and CMMI levels and all of those sorts of things. <clears throat> the problem with those is that, well, there are a lot of problems. They're not context sensitive. They tend to rate that certain things are better than others, and your goal is to get to the end of the model and a bunch of those sorts of things. Um, a fluency model is different. A fluency model says there are proficiencies. Um, there are a lot of different proficiencies and different practices and different way of doing things. And in fact, there are dependencies among those. You're going to have a lot of trouble um, doing uh, automated deploy verification if you don't have any form of automated developer tests, right? Because there's a pretty hard dependency there. And there are a lot of other more subtle dependencies as well. Um, but with a fluency model, we're looking not just at do you do this thing, but we're looking at when and how. So there's basically three levels of, of fluency at a practice. Um, so if we take the practice of red-green refactor, so I'm going to just zoom in. If I can find it. There we are. Red-green refactor. Okay. So rapid coding inner, inner loop and that, that practice of I'll make some code red, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make the system red by making a test fail or, or something like that. Then I'll make it green, then I'll refactor, and I'll go through that loop every, <clears throat> well, how long? All right? So how long should you go through that loop? Or how long should it take you to do one cycle of that loop? Ideas? Thoughts? Minute? minute? Other ideas? How long does it take you today to do that? You on your team, or to, to borrow a phrase, that buddy you have at totally not your company. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take him to do that? Four days. <laughs> Four days. <laughs> yeah, OK. And probably a wide range of times between those two, right? between a minute and four days. And this is what we're talking about with fluency. So, there are things that you're doing aspirationally. You know, we understand what red, green, and refactor are, and we go through those things in a sequence. At the best of times, it takes us a long time. When the moon aligns, when our manager lets us, right? We're aspiring to do it. Right? 
There's a level below that where people say red, green, or factor, and you say, huh? Right? So, so getting to the level of, of aspiring is an important step. Right? And then there's another significant level, and that's fluency. And that's where you practice whatever practice it is transparently, without thought, and it's what you revert to under times of stress. So I might not always red, green, or factor, but when the build is down and I'm in a rush and I've got a manager breathing down my neck, I always do. Right? I might not always pair program. I do a little bit of code, just exploratory or whatever, but system downtime, we're pairing, 100%. Absolutely, without thought. We don't even consider doing otherwise. That's a team that's fluent at those practices. Right? So the interesting thing is the results that you get depend on the outcomes of the practices that you're fluent at, not the ones you're aspiring to. You get what you do in, your, in the worst case when the chips are down, because it doesn't take that long of reverting away from TDD before your code acts as if <laughs> you didn't really TDD it. Right? Um, so if you want to focus on the outcomes, you need to focus on what you're fluent at, not what you're aspiring at. And yet, what most teams and people and managers reward and look at is what are we aspiring to do? What do we understand? What do we do most of the time when things are good, etc. cetera? Right? So what I often find, one of the uses of this particular model is it identifies a bunch of different practices. I mentioned red, green, or factor, you know, done definition, having a clear definition of what does it mean to complete a piece of work, whether that's a story or a particular uh, uh, commit that you're doing uh, or an uh, organizational change that you're making or a management task or, you know, <laughs> bothering to have a definition of done that you state in advance, right? That is a practice. And again, some teams are aspiring to it. Some teams are fluent at it. Some people, some teams don't really think about doing it at all, <laughs> right? Um, so what I find is that a lot of teams typically start out desiring to do all these things over on the right. They want to do lean startup and hypothesis-driven development, and they want to do continuous deployment. And they want to do evolutionary design and all of these great, wonderful things, and bug zero not have bugs. And they figure that it's not actually that far away. They just need to do a little bit of CI and, and a couple of tests. And they can see you know, automated rollback as a thing that, oh yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to do that. But then they have no real visibility because they're aspiring to do all of these things. They feel like they're pretty close. But then when you ask them what they do when the chips are down, what they do by habit, They're over here. It's like, do you have a single assignment team that every team all the time has only one assignment and it would be absolutely mental for anyone in your organization to ever give a team two different jobs? If, if it would be seen as absolutely crazy and the manager who tried to do that would not so much be fired as just kind of looked at funny, then you probably have single assignment teams. If, if not, you might be aspiring to them, but you're not fluent at it yet. All right? And so I see a lot of companies out there that are aspiring to all of the things on here, but are actually fluent at none of them. And that's what the two to three years of technical evolution really looks like. It's taking all the things that you've heard of, all the things you aspire to do, all the things that you do some of the time, and actually becoming completely fluent at them. Having it be so that all of your systems just support them as the normal way of doing. All of your culture supports them as the normal way of doing. Right? That it would be that when someone new comes into the organization, in the first couple of weeks where they're just sitting, they're, they're just you know, joining the team and sort of following along, they naturally and immediately start exhibiting the behaviors of doing these things because it's just the way you do things. Right? So what we're going to look at starting basically now, is what does it look like to attain real fluency at each of these things? The, you do all of them without thought. And what's the ordering that matters? And you'll, you'll note, as I 
had this thing zoomed out. There is not a linear sequence. This part's sort of a mess. <laughs> there are a whole lot of things that all sort of depend on each other. And no, you can't read them at this. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll zoom in to, so you can read things, right? Um, but just sort of looking at the lines, the dependencies are all over the place. There is no single linear sequence. And that's fine. You and your team will choose what your sequence is based off of what your, what your value delivery is going to be um, and what your context is. So, um, just want to start uh, uh, exploring this a little more deeply. Um, so, what are some, let's just start with what are some practices that your team is aspiring to do, doing okay, um, but not yet fluent at? having occasional trouble with, or some team at a company you know. <laughs> Deploy, OK. Um, so, so, that's, so this is an example of part of the reason that I first wrote this is a lot of the terms that we use, people use to describe what actually isn't just one practice. And when you say deploy and he says deploy and I say deploy, we mean three entirely different things that to us are each deploy, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm going to need to ask for a little more nuance on this. And I'm going to with everything that everyone asks. If you said refactoring or TDD, I've observed 14 different definitions of refactoring and seven different definitions of TDD. So deploy fewer. But so when you say deploy, uh, what do you mean by that? Okay, so fast automatic deployments. Okay, does it include the ability to automatically verify whether that deployment is uh, uh, worked correctly after the fact, after it was deployed? Okay, does it include the ability to automatically roll back? Not necessarily, not Okay, um, does it imp include upstream automatic verification or uh, before deploy, or um, are there allowed to be manual steps before deploy? There can be manual steps before deploy. Okay, so um, what we're talking about here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Come on, screen. Is this one automated deploy? Okay, where we've got some automated build verification going on, right? Um, but if you go look further to the right of automated deploy, there are some of the things that I asked, you know, like automated deploy verification. This, would, this is where you're starting to do a bunch of smoke tests to, uh, on your production server all of the time to see after the fact whether your systems are running and the like and automated rollback and all sorts of things that are in the future of this, right? Um, so the first thing is if we're working on deploy, scale it, right? <laughs> and make sure we know what we're looking at. Right. If we tried to do, if we're in the system here that he's describing, where we're having trouble with automated deploy, and we might be having trouble down here, right? And we included in that trying to do automated rollback, life's going to be hard, and I don't like hard. Right. So let's get this one working well. Okay. So automated deploy. Um, do you already have an automated uh, build verification? Okay. Full CI for the whole system with automated verification. Sanity. What was that? Sanity. <laughs> Sanity. Sanity checks. OK. So there's still some manual stuff that's going on as well. OK. Um, all right. So okay. you already have automated packaging. All of that stuff's already in place. OK. Um, you've got some degree of automated developer testing going on. Okay. All right. So it's sounding to me, and, and I'm not asked enough questions, and, and you would really need to answer it. But, it, but my impression is that you're, you're fluid at this level, right? Um, and you're aspiring to automated developer testing, but you aren't yet fluent at it. And you're aspiring to automated build verification. And you're aiming at fluency up here. And so this is one of those examples where I'd say, great, yes, deploy is the goal. And there's a bunch of things that we want to do to improve the goal. And so we're going to set that as the goal. And we're not going to focus on it at first. <laughs> we're going to focus on a prereq, right? Um, and then we'll get that prereq and get fluent at it. And then the next one, and the next one, and then the goal. 
And this one, it sounds like you're only two or three prereqs away. But I would start by, OK, how do you become really fluent at that automated developer testing um, and automated build verification so that you can deploy it without those steps? Yeah. Now, you still can be doing the deploy that depends on the manual steps and whatever else. That's aspiring level. And that's better than nothing. Right? That's better than we deploy by manually overnight fi copying a bunch of files and hoping that we end up in the right place. <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely better. But getting to full fluent level will require fluent level at these prereqs. So what's another one that some people are experiencing? Any old either a problem that you're having or a practice that you're, uh, you're not yet really fluent at and you want to become better at? Fewer bugs. Fewer bugs. OK. So that's a good one. Um, so when you say fewer bugs, everyone aspires to having fewer bugs. Um, <laughs> um, what is the definition of a bug? OK, so a uh, definition of bug includes that it is visible to a customer. OK, all right. Um, and then um, when a customer gives you a complaint, um, are all of those complaints bugs or are some of them not bugs? There's no right answer to this question. Right? It's, it's with your team and in your context. Is, uh, is every customer call to your tech support line, for example, a bug or not? No. OK. All right. Um, so you're focusing on then reducing the bugs that are customer visible that pass some particular screen. Um, and I'm not going to go into depth on exactly what that screen is, but you have an intuitive sense. And I assume that actually a lot of you are in a similar case, and you'll all have different screens, but you have something that's, that's there that's the difference between a customer complaint and a bug. And you're focusing on the one category and not the whole set. Right. That's a pretty common state. Right? Right. Um, if you were over, that tells me that you are over towards the left side of this chart. If you're over towards the right chart, side of this chart, like bug zero, which I'll be giving a talk about that in a couple of hours. Um, the definition of, of a bug that teams use over there is if it would be visible by a human, that human could be another dev, that can, human can be me just in the short term near future. Um, if it would be visible by any human other than the person who is actively writing it right now. So if I check it into source control, even if I don't push me, if I check it in, it would now be visible by a future me. <laughs> That's a bug, <laughs> right? Um, and the definition of a bug is anything which frustrates, confuse, or, uh, confuses, or annoys a user. WTFs all count, right? Any call to tech support would count. Any dev who looks at a code and goes, huh? Bug. Right? <laughs> it's a much different definition of bug. <laughs> right? And both definitions are OK. That's the first thing, is that yes, if we want to get all the way out here and really be living the life of not having any bugs and, and, and really cool things that are over here, we eventually will need to acquire that definition. But we're probably not there today. So we shouldn't take on that definition right now, because it will just drive us freaking crazy. So if I'm over here, probably. And I would guess, if we, if we start looking at the things that lead into getting rid of bugs, there's bugs decreasing over time, and then that has some prereqs. And there's no bugs in new code. You know, we accept that all of our old code has a whole bunch of bugs, and that when we modify old, bugs, old code, we still introduce bugs. But if we're writing new greenfield code, we can do it without bugs in any way. Right? Much narrower definition. Right? And useful step along the way. Right? And then I'd start looking back and I'd start looking at, you know, typically the ways that you're getting to no bugs and new code involve a number of things. So it directly depends on being able to test units 
and actually being able to work together for discipline. All right. So this is an interesting one because we often look at the prereqs of these things and, you know, no bugs. Oh, TDD, that should solve it. And things about refactoring and things about testing, we, get, we lump those in and, yeah, that makes sense. But pairing or mobbing, also huge impact on defects. In fact, huger. <laughs> um, if we look at, uh, Corey Haynes does an interesting uh, uh, experiment on himself every year, which is um, he does a whole bunch of different projects over the course of the year. Um, and there's some self-similarity between them. They're small, relatively small, you know, four or five month projects. And uh, for many of the projects, he applies all the various techniques and everything that he knows. And then a, a couple of times a year, he intentionally drops one practice. So he'll do all of XP except I'm not going to pair. Or he'll do all of XP except I'm not going to write any automated tests. Or all of XP except I will never refactor. I'll write tests, but I won't refactor. <laughs> or, and so on and so on. And so he's able to see what is it that each benefit, what are the benefits that each practice brings. Right? And so he sees that, for example, testing doesn't actually decrease his bug rate. What he find, finds is that in every project, he gets better than the project he was before. He's able to deliver more value with less effort with fewer defects than the prior project, except if he didn't do TDD on a project, then his next one is the same as that one. TDD's purpose is learning for the future. That's the value it delivers. Refactoring drops bugs. Pairing drops bugs. Mobbing drops bugs. Right. So that's where it's, it's interesting to look at some of these. Um, and another one that's, that's uh, really interesting is several of these. You know, no bugs in new code really depends on some, some of the stuff about learning and retrospectives, right? Because root causing defects is a primary way to eliminate them. Okay. So um, what I would suspect is that with the definition that you gave, um, you should probably look more towards the left side of this graph. And there are a number of these things probably around refactoring that uh, the team doesn't do or doesn't do fluently. Um, and I didn't ask any questions, so that's, that's on the basis of guess, not data. Um, but I guess it's probably true. Um, and so those, were the, those are the things I would start looking at. Yeah. Ask you a question on this side of the yeah. You have, uh, no, the, the, the other way. You have a Yagini after bug zero. Yeah. Why after? <laughs> Why after? Can anyone answer that question? I believe in the simplest talk that could possibly work, so I'm not going to answer things you are. Why does Yagni and simplest, uh, and simplest thing depend on bug zero? In particular, why can't you do Yagni if you're still introducing defects? <laughs> You're not feature complete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's part of it. Yeah. Other things? <laughs> what was that? There'll be hacks in the code. Yeah. So the practices that lead to really being bug zero um, and being able to to maintain not writing bugs in the first place require a tremendous amount of discipline. And they require, that's where you do a lot of the learning to be able to make a change in a small chunk without breaking anything. Right. So what happens if I design a system using Yagni and I don't have the ability to then in the future change it without breaking anything? What happens when I change it in the future? Because the simplest thing that could possibly work today guarantees it's too simple to work tomorrow. Right? So I'm going to have to change it. What's going to happen when I change it? It's going to break. It's too risky for me to do simplest thing and simple design if, in changing that design, I'm going to break it. What is the alternative if I don't do Yagni? Plan ahead. 
Predictive, predictive design is a great freaking idea. In fact, if you go look at it over here, there are a whole lot of things that do depend on it. You know, some of the predictive design, pattern-oriented design, big design up front, those are good practices. And I don't have hard dependencies on things because I haven't been able to figure out exactly what the hard dependencies are. But these deliver value. And being good at those things is a really good and useful thing that will make it easy to do other parts of development. Right? And as you go on, and as you bring on other capabilities, you can start getting reflective design, for example, where you've got both predictive and reflective going on. Some where I'm sensing what's going on in the code and so on. Right? And yeah, it's not until I've combined all these capabilities together that I'm ready to actually just do Yagni. If I were to do it before then, I'd have some problems. So reflective design includes don't over-design, right. right? Which is different than, than full-on Yagni. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, rather than simplest over-simple thing, it's define uh, something that's not crazy complex, that we reflect, that we do something and then we re reflect on what's there and we use that to simplify. Right? Um, and so the concepts like Yagni, again, Yagni is one of those like TDD that it means different things across these levels. And it's absolutely worth thinking of red, green, refactor when you're down here and just starting to talk about refactoring. Because what red, green, refactor tells you when you're just learning refactoring is I should separate changing behavior from changing design. That's an important and useful thing. That's the only benefit that you gain from thinking red-green refactoring at that point. <laughs> and it becomes a far more specific, nuanced thing later when you have other capabilities. But it is absolutely shows up here. And Yagni and simple design do show up. They're, they're a good concept to keep in mind. And they show up in various forms throughout these things. Yeah. But, but when you hear, like, when you observe the way that Ward codes things, <laughs> Ward Cunningham codes things, right? He's, he's doing this kind of Yagni that for most of the rest of us result in broken systems. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, a couple of things about this. Uh, first, this chart. Um, <laughs> the chart itself, this is based on my experience and the experience of a few people, several people out there that I know. Um, it is hosted on GitHub. Um, I accept pull requests. I heartily encourage pull requests. I do not claim that this is perfect. In fact, this morning, I was talking about it with Nicole. And we were uh, because she has all this awesome data about continuous deployment and continuous delivery. And I asked, so what's missing? And she filled in you know, this build fast enough trunk-based development feature flags, those elements. The ones that look like they're sort of in a funky place on the chart. I identified the right dependencies, but I don't know actually where it sits on the chart yet because that showed up this morning. <laughs> um, so this is live and it's intended to, to, to change as, as we incorporate knowledge from more and more people. Please send some pull requests and participate. Um, and all you have to do to do so, each of these, well, that one's boring. Some of these are boring. Um, some of these people have filled out already. So some of these we've, we've filled out, you know, what it is, the benefits that it gains, um, the key mind shifts that are necessary in order to get there. Um, a lot of these, I see punctuated evolution. I don't see teams just sort of getting a little bit and then getting a little bit. They sort of they are aspiring and whatever, and then suddenly there's this mind shift that happens, and they think about it in a different way, and they become fluent very quickly after that. And so for a lot of these, there's that core mind shift um, and this one, you know, sitting together, the mind shift is that we're switching from I need some quiet time to do my work to 
work is a collaborative thing. Right? And that's the mind shift that switches it from sitting together, yeah, occasionally to, well, duh. Right? Um, and then some stuff about acquiring the skill, entertaining fluency, and recipes, and so on. So um, people are contributing those as they discover practices that work well for their teams. And I'm continuing to push those and recommend. So anyone have one of these? that your teams have recently done and become pretty fluent at? Just, if you don't know exactly what it is on the chart, just a, a skill or a practice that within the last three months, you went from an aspiring level to a fluent level at. Yeah? All work visible on one board. All work visible on one board. OK. Cool. Great. So let's edit it. So the data for all of this is a big JSON file. Um, and you can live edit it on the page. And then when we're done editing, um, it will have updated the JSON blob that's right there. And we just copy and paste that into the file that sits in the thing and check it into source control. Right? So anyone at any time can edit whatever we want. So sounds like your team has some insights for the world on all work visible on one board. So, I think, uh, so the background to this is we had our own ticketing system mm -hmm. where people could raise lots of more appropriately. The business users would raise uh, issues with the text, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then there wasn't really the kind of visibility that at a team meeting you could pull out and say, this is what the whole team is working on, this is what I'm working on, this is what my buddy is working on. So when we switched over to using Kanban and getting all the work there on the Kanban board, it became much easier at a glance to look at the board, figure out what the distribution of work is like, more importantly, how much work is piled up at any given time. So I think now it's become central to our team meetings to look at the board and let everyone else in the team know what I'm doing now or where I'm stuck. Okay. So you described some of the value and some of what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do uh, how it helps. More specifically, what value have you seen out of really becoming fluent at it, about it becoming your norm? Uh, firstly, it makes the meetings more efficient. You've got to spend less time doing a question and answer session because everyone knows what they want to share with the team. So you cut down the amount of time spent in asking people what they're working on. Instead, it becomes a deep dive sort of time. So instead of me asking, you know, what did you do, and then the next guy spends five minutes telling me what, I just let everyone do their updates in 10 minutes, and then deep dive into whoever needs to talk about something in more detail. So it helps uh, make better use of that time. OK. So I heard a couple of things from that, right? So. Um, it cuts the status out of status meetings. <laughs> and in two ways, right? Um, both in the way of tell me your, your status, what's going on right now, and, and so on. And the other way of in any meeting in which you are describing what you're doing and everyone is, everyone is basically justifying why they have a job. And you see status fights effectively of, oh, these were the things I did yesterday, and I'm cool. <laughs> right. And as soon as that gets out of the verbal and just onto a board, what's the status? Well, there. <laughs> right. Then a lot of that one-upmanship fades from the meetings. And it becomes much more about what you were describing, problem solving. Yeah. Okay. So what were some of the techniques that you did? I'm going to skip several of these steps. Free racks, recipes. Um, what were some of the ways that you attained fluency? So we started doing more regular meetings, like stand-ups that we do in Scrum, even though we're all doing Scrum. Started with uh, the physical Kanban board. We would actually use sticky notes to put in the work items. Eventually, we transitioned to using Jira. But the principle of using the board to guide that flow of the meeting, that stuck with us through the signups. So that now that's always the first item on the agenda when the meeting starts. 
Okay. So here you wrapped a, a process, one of your existing processes. You used it to wrap around the thing that you were trying to bring on. Okay. Okay. We started with the physical board, changed it to an electronic board on Jira. Mm -hmm. But the, the principle of using the board to set up the meeting agenda, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What it, so what I was, so what I first heard you say that might not have been right was that you were you had had regular meetings of some sort around status and what was going on, and then. You changed that meeting at the same time as you introduced the board in order to incorporate and use the board. Pretty much. I mean, we yeah. use the frequency to make it more like stand ups. Okay. Yeah. So that's, a, that's an important thing. That's actually a general practice, right? If you're trying to bring on a new thing and make it fluent, Incorporate it into the things you already do fluently. Right? And something that makes work visible fits really well in the place that we're trying to see what the hell's going on. <laughs> right. um, but, you, but similar practice uh, approach works other places as well. Um, when I'm trying to learn to refactor, um, when is the time that I should refactor code? Thoughts? All coding is refactoring. I disagree. Sometimes I'm changing behavior. Sometimes, sometimes in order to, to verify whether I did something right, I have to run a test, in which case it's not refactoring. If I'm refactoring, if I'm really refactoring, I don't need to run tests to know I'm right. I can refactor just as cleanly on test-free code as on highly tested code, and just as safely. So when do I refactor? By the way, this is a very different, this is the, the much closer to Martin Fowler's original definition of refactoring than most current definition. Most current definition of refactoring is, oh, I changed the code. <laughs> I don't think I broke anything. <laughs> right. But when is the time that I, can, I should most, that I should really focus my intention on improving the design in known safe ways that are guaranteed bug for bug backwards compatible? What was that? After, after you, green line. After green? Yeah. Yeah. So during writing of the code, when I'm doing the initial writing of the code. Yeah. So that's the answer that a lot of people give, and that's because that's the answer that a lot of people have been teaching for a very long time. I actually find that when you're writing the code is when you have the least idea of what the design should be. Because the most important thing about code design is does it convey intent? And at the moment that you are writing the code, you already have all the information that it should convey in your head. Therefore, you are completely insensitive to being able to tell whether it conveys intent at all. So the time that you should refactor is when you're reading code. That's the moment where you don't know whether, where it either conveyed intent or it didn't. <laughs> Right? And so that's, that's another example of exactly this case. If I'm trying to bring refactoring on, if I, bring, if I tell people to refactor at the time that they're writing code, then they end up with a very sloppy definition of refactors. I'm writing some code, oh, I think that design doesn't work, and, and back and forth. If I say, no, you need to do it when you read code. So I need you to do a practice that is for, yeah, it's legacy code, so there, assume there's no tests. Assume that the thing is unintelligible, and the way that you're going to read it is to refactor it, and I want you to have the same defect characteristics as other ways of reading code, which means you no way, no how, ever introduce a new bug or accidentally fix one. You bring on a very different definition of refactoring, very naturally. Right? It's that same technique of wrap it into an existing process. So um, I've gotten the magic flag that says we're supposed to shift out of this kind of Q&A to the other kind of Q&A, which is somehow different. Um. <laughs> so feel free to ask any arbitrary random questions <laughs> if you hadn't already. Do you have BDD on the... um, is BDD on here? Um, 
So BDD and TDD are both terms that I explicitly did not put on here because they mean so many different things to different people. However, many of the things that people mean when they say BDD are on here and at many different ones. So um, when people are saying BDD, one of the meanings is uh, having a clear done definition. One of the meanings is uh, somewhere I have test a spec. Um, I don't remember where it is, but it's, trust me, it's in here somewhere. I'm just not seeing it at the moment. Oh, there it is, right here. Right? Um, and there are a number of other meanings as well that show up. Uh, some, some people use that to mean integration testing, which is over here on the left, automated integration testing. Right. So, yes and no, both. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, then um, I heartily encourage you to uh, play with this, do whatever uh, you find useful. It's up on GitHub, um, on my GitHub, uh, Arlo Belshi. Um, you can also get to it at bit.ly slash agile engineering stages, which I will tweet the URL right after this talk because I don't have any slides for this talk, so there's nowhere for me to write the URL. Oh, yes, there is. I believe. There we go. I put it on the document. <laughs> There's a PDF version that I update every, every so often, um, as well as the, uh, the live version. Um, if you go look at this right now, it's got some changes like the ones from this morning that are not incorporated into master yet. I haven't accepted my own pull requests. Um, but I continue to do that, and that will generally be the case. So I encourage you, um, please use it however you find useful. Um, and when you do make a transition and become fluent at something, if you can record some of the things that you did that worked and incorporate that for other people to share, um, I would heartily appreciate it. So thank you very much.